Uh, thanks uh, for, for inviting me to, to this uh, interesting place and, and uh, interesting course. I haven't had the opportunity to, to listen to all the other interesting presentations, but uh, um, I, will, I will try to introduce you to this question of philosophy and, and astrobiology. Actually, there are lots of um, interactions between philosophy and astrobiology, like as with philosophy in space and philosophy and biology. Uh, as you know, if you go far back in time to the, to the old Greek, uh, everything was philosophy. Philosophy was just defined as the, the, uh, the search for truth, right? Uh, so, uh, understanding the, the skies above and the, the, the um, living uh, nature was all part of philosophy. After that, things have gone in, in, in different directions and there have been specializations. Um, and today, uh, philosophy is not so concerned with, with uh, empirical questions. Uh, today, philosophy is more about dealing with the questions that cannot be dealt with by empirical science. And I will show you some of them here. Um, so I will talk about both the uh, philosophy of science part and the, the uh, ethics part. Philosophy of science where we talk about like the basics of what, what you're doing. And the, the ethics part where we try to put things into a bigger societal perspective. So when it comes to philosophy of science, as I said, that I, I will give you some, some uh, like start by giving you some examples of questions that has to do with philosophy and astrobiology. And then I will go into more detail with a few of them just to show how we work with them. Uh, so, for instance, when we talk about philosophy or astrobiology, the obvious qu first question is, what is life? Uh, that's not as obvious as one might think, unfortunately. Uh, but, but it's fun. So we'll talk more about that later. Okay. Uh, there are other questions. One question has to do with evidence. As you know, there have been many claims through the ages that people have found extraterrestrial life, for instance. Um, there have been quite, quite recently some, some um, um, claims about the atmosphere of Venus. There have been claims about Mars. Um, a while ago, there were like 10 years ago or something, there were a discussion about um, whether um, li some, some group claimed they had found life extremophiles on Earth where um, the um, phosphor could, could be um, uh, exchanged in the backbone of the, of the DNA. Uh, and all of this was questioned. And it remains the question, what, what actually counts as evidence? If we want to claim that we have found something, some new uh, discovery about the origin of life, or some, even some life on, on another world, what, uh, what kind of evidence do we need? And then there is, of course, the, the other side of the coin. What kind of evidence do we need if we want to claim that there is no life on another world? It sounds like it's just the, the turning of the table, right? You, um, it, if you don't find life, you find no life. But it's not that simple. It's actually, these are actually, from a philosophy of science point of view, two completely different questions that you have to go about in, in, in very different ways. And I'll talk more about that later. Then we have some ethical questions. Uh, there are lots of them. Uh, for instance, the first one, again, I guess, should we do this at all? Uh, there have been people questioning this, um, saying that, well, there are lots of very important uh, and very severe problems on Earth today. Shouldn't we focus on them, right? Instead of, of using a lot of money on, on um, like finding extraterrestrial life, for instance. Um, some people, there, there have been some, some surveys in the US, it turned out that most people grossly overestimate 
how much money is put into space research. It wasn't specifically about astrobiology, but space research in, in general. Uh, I was involved in a, in a survey at, among Swedish students, and it turned out that the support for astrobiology is, is huge. It's big support. It's, it's also found that those who are against it, those who think we shouldn't spend um, money, resources on this kind of research, they mostly think that it's because it's expensive, and because it doesn't provide any, any direct benefits to them. Right. But they, they are a, minor, a minority. Most people, most of these students, thought we should definitely do this. And among those who said yes, most of them said we should do this because it's interesting, it's cool, it provides um, knowledge, not for any, any practical benefits, but just this knowledge as itself. Is, is worth it. So there are different opinions about this and I will not go into this discussion in any detail. I'm just mentioning that there is this discussion. We can talk about it later. I hope there will be time for, for some, some, some more discussions because that's what I think is fun. Uh, I'm a philosopher. So, so uh, what's the moral status of extraterrestrial life? If we, if we find anything outside of Earth, uh, how, how, how can we... Um, deal with them? What kind of studies can we do with them? Huh? Um, yeah, and, and what will we be allowed to, to do with this, this life? Um, and if we don't know that there is life, like what is the case right now with all worlds outside of Earth? We don't know. Um, what can we do? This is implications, for instance, for planetary projection. Right now, we don't know whether there is life on Mars or not, but we have some rules about what we're allowed to do uh, in order to protect the Mars environment from biocontamination from Earth. And there are different opinions about this. Uh, some think that, that it's, oh, it's fine the way it is. We have uh, protection. We have, we have to, there are different guidelines, uh, I will not go into this here, but we can talk about it later if you want to. Um, and they are sufficient, they will give us enough time to, to, to find and, and study life on Mars before it's contaminated. Uh, others say that we need to, be, we need to go further. Uh, for conservation reasons, because the, this um, possible Mars life has value, not just as stu study objects, but for other reasons, like more, st more status, for instance. Uh, but also that, you know, science usually don't run out of questions. So saying that we have sufficient time to study a biology is probably meaningless, because you, the more we study it, the more questions we will get. Um, so they have some, uh, some things that we should go even further with the protection. Others go in the other direction and say that, no, we should weaken the, 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 um, the protection. Either because, ah, there's probably no life on Mars. Or because, uh, ah, Earth organisms will probably not be able to survive on Mars anyway. Or because we don't care about organisms, we want to put people on Mars. Some people, you know, um, say this. And they think that planetary protection and crap like that is just in the way for, for progress. So there are different opinions about this. Um, what are we allowed to do in a world where there is no life? Let's say we can actually show that there is no life on Mars. Um, does that mean we can do whatever we want? There's no life that will be hurt. But still, some claim that, well, non-living environments can have, can have value and even more status on their own. Um, for instance, if we decide that um, there is some precious metal in Olympus Mons, you know, Olympus Mons is the highest mountain in the solar system, and we want to strip mine it, can we do that? Let's say there is no life. Is it still okay to strip mine the, the highest mountain in the solar system? Um, so there are different opinions on this too, and use discussions about this. Um, and yes, um, how far do we have to go to protect the Earth environment from back contamination? It's just, uh, planetary protection is not just about protecting other worlds from biocontamination from Earth. Uh, 
There's also something called back contamination, and that has to do with protecting the Earth environment from contamination by extraterrestrial um, organisms. So when we get samples back from Mars, for instance, which is there are plans to do, um, then we need to have some rules in place to how to handle them in case there is any Martian life and we don't want that to, to invade, invade Earth. As we know on Earth, it's, it's really difficult to foresee what happens if you move one species from one place to another. Uh, in many cases it's, it's, it's harmless, in most cases they will not be able to survive there. In some cases it goes straight to, uh, yeah, creates a lot of problems, right? Um, so what do we do when we have samples from a place where we don't even know if there is any life, not, less, uh, not, 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 uh, not to mention what kind of life it is and, and if there is any and what you can do and so on. Uh, so, so yeah, there are some questions, some ethical questions having to do with astrobiology. Let's take a closer look at, at some of the questions. Let's start with this one. What is life? How do we define life? Any opinions? <laughs> okay, I'll start. Right? Uh, so the thing is, finding a definition of life is pretty important if you work with astrobiology. Whether you work with trying to find life on, on other worlds, or if you try to find the origin of life, for instance, um, it is pretty important. And in fact, it's much more important if you do one of these things, if you work with astrobiology, compared to if you work with just, just biology. Um, and there are two reasons for this. One practical reason and, and one more conceptual reason. The practical reason is that if you work with life as a biologist, then you usually work with known life. Right? You work with you're studying, I don't know, wolves, you're studying um, uh, dandelions, uh, you're studying some interaction between uh, predator and prey. You, you study stuff that you already know are alive and there's no real question about whether it's alive or not. Of course, there could be cases where you study like virology, virus, that's a, that's a borderline case. There's no real agreement whether they are alive or not. But usually you don't study them as a biologist, but as a, as a um, medical researcher. And the only thing you're interested in is how to kill them, right? So whether they're alive or not doesn't matter too much. And if you're a biologist, you study things that everyone knows is alive already. So it's not that important. You can go ahead and be a very, uh, do really good research in biology or uh, medicine without really knowing the exact borders of life. It's different. If you, if you work in astrobiology. If you, for instance, are looking at the, the uh, origin of life on Earth, you need to be able to draw like, the line between biology and chemistry to know what you're looking for. And if you, if you work with astro astrobiology in the sense that you look for, for life on other worlds, again, you need to know what you're looking for. You, you need to know that to look in the right place to uh, use the right instruments, to use the right tests, and also to know whether you, whether you have succeeded or not. Right? Um, if you find some green blob on Enceladus, uh, is that life or not? You need to, you need to be able to, to uh, tell the, the editors and reviewers of Nature that this is actually life, and, and to be able to argue for it. Uh, so there are practical uh, implications. Uh, right. There are also, I would say, a conceptual um, reason. And that's that it, this is kind of the whole point with astrobiology. Biologists, they study living things. Astrobiology study like life in itself. They study where it comes from. Right? Where, where it, how it's distributed, how it's developing. The astrobiologists tend to study the borders of life and the border conditions of life, where it comes from, where, it is, where we can find it and so on. So for astrobiologists, 
this question of how to define life is much more important than it is usually for, for, for biologists, for most biologists. Anyway, lots of people have weighed in on this and tried to, try to produce an answer. Yeah, uh, we have the, um, the, uh, one of the definitions of astrobiology here. So, astrobiology is studying like life as itself in its borders. Um, the thing is, lots of people have tried to answer this question. Biologists, philosophers, um, chemists, um, information theory people, computer scientists, even physicists. You know, people from all kinds of, of, of disciplines have, have opinions on this for this and different reasons. So, let's finally get the answer. No. I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that there is no real lack of answers. There are lots of suggestions. Of course, the bad news is that there are too many of these suggestions and we haven't been able to agree on which one is the right, the right one. Um, so how do, how do we do this? How do we go around working with this? Well, basically, what people are looking for is what uh, philosophers call a dere definition. Um, with Latin, in it, it means like the thing in itself. So we want to find the real definition of, of life that really, really defines the essence of life. That's what people try to do. Uh, and that's done in the form of listing properties that are necessary. If we are lucky, we can find one particular pro property that is necessary to be alive. In which case it's also sufficient. So if you have this particular property, you're alive. If you don't, you're not. Or maybe you, want, maybe you find a set of properties, like let's say five properties that are all necessary, that all life has. And if you don't have all of them, you're not life. So a sufficient set of necessary criteria. What kind of criteria? Well, I guess you've heard some. Here are some examples. Um, some say that what signifies life is that life recreates itself. Life procreates. Um, which is, is not a bad idea because there is a very strong connection between, between being alive and being able to, to, to uh, procreate. Um, there are some issues with it, which means that um, it's, it's controversial. One, obviously, is that some life is sterile. So not all living beings can actually procreate. There's also a question, is it, are, we, are we looking at actual procreation or the ability pro to procreate? It seems that if you have the ability to have offspring but choose not to, then you should still be alive. On the, other on the other hand, there are methodological issues with this. If something, whatever it is we find on, on Enceladus or Mars or whatever, if it doesn't actually procreate, how do we know it has the ability to procreate? So, so that's not, not easy. Um, and what about the, the sterile individuals? Aren't they alive? That sounds very strange. So procreation, Mm, there are problems with that. Also, there are things that procreate without being alive. At least we don't think they are alive, like computer viruses. Are they alive? They do, they do um, kind of procreate. Um, what, what, what about if we say that... Well, okay, not all members of, let's say, the human species procreate or can procreate, but... Um, at least they belong to a species where most of the individuals can procreate. That, that's, that's great. But obviously there are problems with that too. What, what about mules and ligers? Do you know what a liger is? Lion. Yeah, it's a cross between a tiger and a lion. Uh, and a mule is of course a, a, um, a cross between a horse and a donkey. And they 
are sterile. They don't really belong to any of the species. They are like bastards, right? They don't really belong to any of the species and they don't procreate. Aren't they alive? That also seems really strange. They, they, they look very alive. Uh, Mu look very alive. Um, so procreation, we haven't found a way of really turning this into the, the essence of life. But what about evolution? Evolution, if there is any concept that's closely connected with life, is evolution. Why not use evolution as, as uh, the essence of life? Well, there are some, some problems. One very practical problem. If we go to, to um, Europa and find something that seems could be alive, then we just have to sit down and wait for it to evolve. Which can take a long time. You know? um, on Earth it, ta it sometimes takes a very long time. There are species that haven't really changed since before the dinosaurs. They're still around. Uh, so it can take a very long time and we don't want to wait for that. We want to get our publication into nature or whatever. So methodologically it's pr a problem, but it's also conceptually a problem. Because what evolves? Populations evolve, not individuals. Individuals change, but we don't evolve. Right? Only the population evolve. So that means that humanity will be alive. But we are not. Any of us who, who, who are here today, we are not alive, but humanity is. That sounds very strange and, and uh, doesn't fit well with how we think about life. So that's, that's odd. Um, which means that maybe ev we cannot use evolution as the essence of life anyway. Even, even evolution that's so closely connected with life cannot be used as, as criteria for, for life. So it's looking bad, but there are more examples on the list. Metabolism, that's pretty popular. Um, all life has to have metabolism. Um, but the problem with metabolism is that the concept metabolism is not well defined on, it, on its own. There are different ideas what, about exactly where to draw the lines between metabolism and non-metabolism. Is uh, a car that's using, using petrol metabolizing and spewing out CO2. Uh, so it's, it's not usually a good idea to define a word by using another word that needs to be defined, that it doesn't have a clear definition in itself. Mm. What about the chemical basis for, for life? Well, yeah, that life has to have a chemical basis. Uh, in one way you can say it's completely non-informative because everything is made up by, by chemical elements. But what about if we identify a particular chemical basis? Uh, that could work, uh, at least if we talk about life here on Earth. Um, but um, is it a good definition? If we find something on uh, another world that um, walks around on, on four, four legs and, uh, and um, look at us uh, when we come in, in our, our uh, landers, but it has a difficult chemical composition than we do. Maybe it uses, um, I don't know, silicon instead of carbon or, or something. Wouldn't it be pretty weird to say that it's not alive? So using the chemical basis for, for, uh, as a, for the definition of life is often seen as uh, implausible because there is no real good uh, scientific reason why life could not have some other basis. The, 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 the chemical basis that makes up us is pretty good. Um, it, it works <laughs> for us, but who says something similar with similar properties could not turn up on some other world with some other chemistry? And it seems a bit uh, arbitrary. Why, why say that our particular chemical, uh, chemical um, composition should, should decide what is life or not? 
Um, yeah, what about DNA? Well, DNA, you could talk about DNA in terms of chemical composition, but as we said before, um, it's maybe not that, that plausible. But some people would li li like to talk about it in terms of information content instead of chemistry. Uh, and this is particularly popular among people who want to uh, invent life, uh, like uh, make robots that are alive or computer programs that are alive. Some even claim that they've actually done that. Uh, it's very contested, but, but, but still. And they like to say that life is about the information, not about the chemical content. We could have a robot that's alive if we can, can um, make it in such a way that it contains um, the information of its own building the same way that we do and make it uh, heritable somehow. That's good for being alive. Yeah, but that includes that it may be, we may have to accept that um, like computer viruses or robots could be alive. Are we prepared to do that? Uh, different opinions on that. Uh, what do you say? Will you, be able, will you say that the computer virus is alive? No? Anyone says yes? <laughs> yes? <laughs> okay. Uh, some careful people say yes. Yeah. Uh, very um, debatable question. Lots of, of um, discussions around this. Uh, some want to look more at the behavior of life uh, and self-regulation is, is popular. Um, so life uh, somehow interacts with its environment and is, is able to um, adapt itself to the environment um, in different ways. But it's a bit difficult to, to um, specify exactly what kind of uh, self-regulation or adaptation this should be. Um, what about a radiator um, with a thermostat? They can, uh, a radiator with a thermostat can, can sense the heat in the room and, and uh, change the, the output of heat from the thermostat. Is that alive? I wouldn't think so. But how do we distinguish between the kind of self-regulation that makes you alive and the kind of self-regulation that the radiator with the thermostat has that doesn't make you alive? Anti-entropy. Yeah, this, this is a, a great one. It's... Uh, popular among physicists. You know, the, the second law of thermodynamics, um, the entropy law, uh, stating essentially that, that all energy um, eventually evens out and, and um, spreads out. Um, so life is a way of, life can uh, counter that. We can, we can um, um, lump together in, in organized um, organized uh, entities like animals and plants and whatever and we can take an uh, energy from the environment to keep this organization to keep us organized in, in a physical sense uh, so we are like increasing the entropy around us but we do that so we can keep our own organization and and not um, not um, be part of this uh, and general entropy process in, in the universe for a while, until we die. Is this a good definition? Well, it's uh, popular with some. Um, others say that, yeah, okay, life can do this, but doesn't seem to catch really what's, what's really the thing with life. What's the thing with life? What, 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 why is life so... Fascinating and amazing. Why do people search for it on, on, on other planets? Why do people study it? Why do people write poems about it? Why is it so important for people to live? Does it have to do with, with the, uh, our uh, way of, of um, handling the second law of thermodynamics? Many people think that is an extremely boring and <laughs> non-inspiring non way of looking at it. Others, physicists, think that, wow, this is super inspiring. Depends on your perspective, I guess. 
Uh, one old uh, answer to the question of what is alive is that you cannot be resurrected. Once you're dead, you're dead. Um, the problem with this is that what does it mean to be dead? It's hard to define dead, being dead, without having a definition of what it means to be alive. So it can be circular uh, and it's not popular anymore. I just brought it on because, because it's, um, it's a classic. So here we stand. What should we do about it? Well, there, there is a general problem. Um, that one group has managed to figure out. Uh, the problem with life is that it evolves. What do you mean problem? Well, the problem is that it's very hard to find an essential property of something that keeps changing. Right? Uh, so, given that we want this one property or set of essential properties that are never changing, always with life, it can be really, really difficult um, since, since life is always evolving. So, maybe this is the wrong way of doing it. And there are other, other suggestions. Uh, I will not go through all of this in, in detail, but um, there are different ways of trying to define life. Um, the prototype definition, uh, maybe you heard about if you studied biology. It means that you take one instance of a species and say that this is the prototype of this species. And whether something it belongs to the same species depends on whether it's sufficiently like this prototype. It's um, difficult when we deal with species. I would say it's kind of impossible when we deal with life. Life is, there's two big uh, differences in when it comes to different life forms to be able to say, we have one prototype. Let's say Hervé here, you're the prototype of life. And whether something is alive, if we find something uh, on Enceladus, this green blob, we take it home and compare it to you, say, if it's, is it sufficiently like Hervé, then it's alive. It doesn't say, seem like the right, a good way of doing it, right? Um, a a stipulative definition says that let's stop finding the one true definition of life and just define it depending on the circumstances. If I want to um, make a certain experiment and uh, it happens to be that my, my um, equipment is sensitive to something, then I define life as this thing that my machine is sensitive to. Great, but it doesn't probably impress anyone else. Uh, so here, here we need something better than that. Uh, a list definition, by the way, it means that we list everything that is alive. Good luck with that. And an ostensi definition means that we don't define it, we just point at it and say, that's alive, you're alive, you're alive, that's why it's not alive. It can, it, it can work when you, when you teach uh, your kids things, but it, not for a general definition. There are other suggestions. One is let's give up and say that we don't need to define life. But as we said in the beginning, that's, that's fine if, if you study things that everyone knows is alive anyway. If you're a biologist studying or, um, zebras or, 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 or whatever. Um, but if you're an astrobiologist and your whole um, research is about understanding like the boundary conditions of life, then you, you need a definition. Others say that let's make ma life a matter of degree. This is a pretty, pretty interesting definition. And we can say that, um, well, not a um, approach to, de to, to a definition. We can say that things can be more or less alive. We can say that uh, all of us who sit here today are, are definitely alive. We can say that viruses are kind of alive. Um, but it's, there are two problems with this. One is that we still need to, to identify the properties 
that that signifies what degree of 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 alive you are. What, what's saying that that uh, I'm more alive than a virus? Must be some property we need to identify anyway. Uh, another problem is that it seems counterintuitive. Uh, people don't like to think about life in that way. Maybe that's because we are wrong. I, I don't know, but but. It's something that we need to need to need to get over, um, maybe. And of course, another problem is that it feels a bit unsatisfactory if you go to what do you say Enceladus and find this green blob, and you say, "Well, I found something that's kind of alive." Try to get that into nature. Um, yeah, uh, but but uh, some people are working with that. Uh, the final suggestion I will mention is what's called family resemblance. Um, not easy to understand what that means. Essentially, it means that it's a kind of weak essentialism. So instead of finding a set of, I don't know, let's say, um, 10 criteria where you need to fulfill all of them to be alive, let's say that we have 10 properties that are closely associated with life, like the ones we saw before. Uh, we saw that None of them is really satisfying, but we, if we say that yeah, they are closely connected with life and uh, you don't have to fulfill all of them. You can fulfill like uh, five of them and something else that you find can fulfill another uh, five of them. And, and uh, so you, it's sometimes also called the cluster definition of life. Uh, it's a bit more fluffy in a way. Um, but uh, the group's working on this, and it's a bit more flexible, so so uh, has some 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 advantages. Um, so as you see, this was a way of introducing a little bit how we are working with these things. What kind of evidence do we need to claim that the world is uninhabited? Well, we obviously we have the question of what kind of evidence do we need to to say that the world is inhabited, but. I choose, to, I choose this one because it's less discussed and it's philosophically really interesting. And there are both interesting science and philosophy aspects of it. So if we go to Mars and find something that's alive, then we know that Mars is inhabited. There is life on Mars. We only have to find one. But if we go there and don't find anything, does that mean there's no life on Mars. Finding life and finding non-life are different things. You can say, yeah, I, bless you. Uh, you can say that I found life, therefore there is life. But you cannot say that I, <laughs> I didn't find life, therefore there is no life. Because there can be other explanations. It could be that you didn't look hard enough or in the right way or in the right place. So establishing that there is no life is, is more difficult. In fact, how many, how many times do you need to go to Mars and not find anything before you can say that there is no life on Mars? So, um, in, in uh, philosophy, we like to say that there is an asymmetry between these two questions. Um, we don't like to talk about proof because, well, proof belongs in logic and mathematics, not in empirical science, but, but evidence. Um, and there is an evidence. Uh, I said proving here, but, but it's a matter of evidence. Um, you cannot prove that Mars is inhabited in the same sense as you can say that, you, you, can, you can prove that it is inhabited. But you can come more or less close. Um, you can be more or less certain. Um, <coughs> It's a little bit like, li like this, you can collect evidence and the more and better evidence you collect, the more certain you will be and it's asymptotically um, approaching certainty, but you will never really get there. So eventually you need to make a decision. Are we certain enough? So what do we do to increase the certainty? And how certain do we need to be? The first is, is kind of a methodological question and the second is a pure philosophical question. 
Um, so if you, like if, if I tell my, my daughter, go and find your, your homework book. Uh, I can't find it. Uh, well, have you looked enough? <laughs> uh, so go into your room again and look again. Go in there and look again and she can't find it. Uh, well, okay, but, uh, and she says, I have looked and looked and looked. I looked for hours and I can't find it. Did you look in the right way? Did you actually turn on the light in your room? Did you open drawers? Did you, did you lift your, uh, uh, all your, your stuffed animals in your, in your bed and look under them? Um, so establishing that there is no life or no homework book or whatever, um, you need to, to uh, have a lot of negative results, but it's not just a matter of quantity. It's also a matter of quality. It means that you need to look in a good way. If you go to Mars and look for life a hundred times, but you're not doing a good job doing it, it's not much in terms of evidence that there is no life. You need also to do it in a good way. You need to have, have uh, to make good tests. But if you send a probe to Mars and make a really good survey of life and then don't find anything. Do you send another one, another lander? It looks in exactly the same place with exactly the same methods a hundred times and it doesn't find life. Okay, not, still not convincing. You need to look with different methods in different places and different parts of, of the surface, under the surface. So basically this, this is what we're dealing with. In order to say that, sorry, there is no life. You need both a, a big number of failed attempts, they need to be good attempts, and you need to look at different places. Um, is this ever going to be, to be an issue? Yes, it is already an issue. Because there are people who want to send humans to Mars. And as we know, um, sending, well, humans are not just alive ourselves, but we are full of life, microbial life. And if we send humans to Mars, we can be pretty sure that we will contaminate Mars with our microbes. You can sterilize a spacecraft to a certain degree, not totally, because some, some microbes are, are tougher than, than some of the electronics, for instance, uh, but to a certain degree. But you cannot sterilize people. <laughs> we will die, right? So if you send people to Mars, Mars will be contaminated. And there's already a discussion. Have we, are we finished looking for life on Mars? Ready to, to leave Mars over to the co commercial actors? Some claim it, uh, we are. Uh, I listened to, to a speech by an American senator who said that, yes. The truth is we haven't been looking that much for life on Mars. Actually, the only time before Perseverance, the robot is there now. Be, the only time before that was uh, in the 1970s when the Viking landers were there. And the results from the Viking landers are still contested. There's still discussions about, did they actually find life or not? Most researchers would say no, but some, some cl claim they, they did. Um, but anyway, um, there are already discussions about when have we studied life enough to say that there's no life, let's, uh, let's uh, terraform it. Um, okay, so we can, we can increase the probability that there is no life by a high number of missions, uh, good quality, high diversity, but when is it enough? Is it enough to say that we have 100 good missions? 10 good missions? 1000 good missions in different places? That's, that's not an empirical question, that's not a science question. This is a philosophical question. It's a matter of what we are prepared to accept. And why? Because, and it, it probably differs a bit be, because of the purpose. When is it enough to publish in Nature that we have found that there is no life on Mars? When is it enough to call a press conference and say that, and tell the, the general public, Mars is dead? When do we have enough evidence for that? 
When it is, is it enough to relax planetary protection, as we just talked about, or start terraforming? You know, when you, when you take an, a planet that's not suitable for human life and turn it, uh, change its atmosphere and its composition so it becomes more like Earth, so we can live there, that's terraforming. Some people want to do that with Mars. Um, so the question of how much evidence do we need to say that, yep, we're certain enough, Depends on the purpose, depends on, uh, on how, uh, um, how risk averse we are and so on. Yeah, let's take the next question. <laughs> What's the more status of extraterrestrial life? If we find life on Mars, can we, uh, what kind of experiment can we do with them? Or uh, can we even just exterminate them and, and uh, terraform us and, and say, uh, I don't care about microbes, I like people, I want to, I want to go there myself. I, I'm not expecting that from, from you guys, but, but we know there are people who would say that. Uh, well, this is a super interesting question that, that, uh, for, for that philosophers think are, think are super interesting. Now, I'm not talking about the value, I'm talking about the moral stages. And I'll say a little bit about this, because this is kind of important. Um, saying that someone or something has value, it can mean different things. And I will not go in to and discuss all of the ways in, things in, in which things can have value, because that, that would take um, many years. <laughs> um, but I just say that, Having moral status, it means that I have to consider your interests when I'm acting. If you have moral interests, uh, sorry, if you have moral status, that means that when I'm doing things that are affecting you, I need to, I need to con consider how they uh, affect you and I need to think about your rights, if that's how you want to, to, to formulate it, uh, and your interest in the matter. If something has value, it may still mean that I have to consider it, but not in terms of consider its own interests. Um, if, let's say that, that um, your car is, let's say that your car is standing outside here and, and that has great value for you. It, it helps you come here and, and go back and it, it um, um, gives you um, status because it's much nicer than all your colleagues' cars, let's say that. Um, it has great value for you. But if I go out and smash the car, because I'm really jealous of your car, then I haven't done, I have done something bad, I've destroyed the value of the car, but I haven't done something bad to the car, but to you. You see what I mean? Uh, the, the car, I just sh shift, shifted the shape of the car. There's no, no, um, what's bad about it is that it, it makes you really sad. The car is not getting sad at all. Um, so here we are, we're talking about two different things. There may, extraterrestrial life may have great value as study objects for us, or it may have great v value for other reasons, great commercial value if we want to, to um, have tourists looking at it or whatever. But the more status is something else. It means that things have value to them and we need to, we need to, to consider that. Does it matter that they are very, will probably be very different from us? Does it matter how far away they are? We know on Earth that people um, organisms that are very different from us, we, we tend to, to uh, care less about them. And we also know that what's happening on the other side of the earth tend to, to um, concern us less than what's happening in our own neighborhood. That's psychology, that's not ethics. Uh, what ethics ask, asks is how should it be? Right. Doesn't matter how intelligent they are, does it matter uh, that they will not be related to us? No matter whether they are similar to us or not, they will not be related to us. We are all related. All the uh, life on, on our planet is related. But if we find life on another planet and it hasn't come there from, from us, 
or we came from them, uh, then we will not be related. Uh, does it matter that they don't belong to the same society or the same biosphere? Um, does it matter whether they are not sentient, whether they are sentient or not? Well, Hollywood, they, their answer is that if they look like us, we should care about them. They recognize the Navi, uh, they are blue and they have tails and pointy ears, but they look pretty human, right? Uh, so, in the film Avatar, we are supposed to care about the Navi. Anyone recognize this guy? From the TV series V. In, in, in that TV series, the, the, the aliens, they came, they looked like us, and they seemed really nice. A group of scientists figured out what they were actually there. They were there to eat us and to steal our water. But people didn't believe that. They looked really nice. So they must be nice. It wasn't until someone managed to tear the mask off and people saw that they were lizard-like that people, people actually thought, oh, these are scary. But this is not how ethics works. It's not, so, it's not how it's supposed to work. There are, in fact, different theories, obviously, even when it comes to Earth life, about what it takes to have more, to have, uh, more status. The classic answer, called anthropocentrism, it means that only human beings can have moral status. Um, it has been debated during the ages whether all moral state, moral, <laughs> whether all human beings have moral status. Today, I would say moral theory is in complete agreement with this. Yes, all moral being, uh, all human <laughs> beings have moral status. But as you know, there are still people who deny this. Uh, but at least. There has been a large degree of consensus that only human beings have more status. Uh, this has come to change, um, at least uh, in the discussion it started to, to, to change gradually. Uh, it's been found out that there are some, some problems with this theory and some other theories have turned up. Um, actually, the first a, a really early case um, where this where anthropocentrism was debated was in the 17th century with the French philosopher uh, um, René Descartes. He st studied how the body was working. He used corpse of humans to study how the body was working, but he also wanted to study the, the, the blood uh, circulation. He couldn't do that on dead bod bodies, so what did he do? He took dogs, he nailed them on the table to their feet and cut them up while they were still alive. And people actually reacted to that and said, this is too cruel, you cannot do that. His, his explanation why he could was religious. He said that they don't have a, a, a soul implanted in them by, by God. So that's, therefore it was okay. Um, but there are issues um, with, with, with this, this idea. Uh, and if we talk about um, extraterrestrial life, obviously, if we talk about our solar system, we will not find any, any humans. In fact, if we talk about uh, outside Earth at all, we will not find any humans in the biological sense, because, well, uh, they will be, if, even if they are very like us, they will not be the same species. Uh, but if we base the anthropocentrism not on the belonging to a certain species, but on having certain properties like being very intelligent, that we think we are, um, then, then we will not find anything that fits into this theory in, in our own solar system. We can be pretty sure of that. Um, if, we, if we manage to find a signal, from, a radio signal from, from, from another solar system, maybe, um, the problem with that is that they may be much more intelligent than we are and they maybe will not count us. Um, so anyway, this, this theory is not that uh, applicable. Um, if we accept it, we will say that we don't care about the, the uh, organisms on another planet other than possibly as study objects. Um, but there are problems with it. Um, so another idea that is going very popular is called sentientism. It means that all sentient beings, all beings that can feel, have feelings, uh, have a moral status. Um, when it comes to astrobiology, the results will essentially be the same. 
We will not find any sentient life in our solar system. You can be pretty sure of that. Um, so the, the kind of beings that we are studying uh, will not be considered uh, moral objects uh, under any of these theories. Uh, or? Uh, we don't understand the world of sentient. Sentient. It means that, that you're, you're conscious and you have feelings. So you, you experience what happening, what's happening to you. And you can, you can feel pain or pleasure. You can, you can feel... Um, yeah, you can, you can feel things. And that, according to this theory, that's why it's important uh, what I do to you. Yes. Uh, was there anyone else? Yeah. Right. Um, but we also have this theory called biocentrism. It says that all living beings have more stages. This theory is complicated. Uh, well, basically it's simple, but, but its consequences are complicated. It seems that, well, one, one issue with it, of course, is that we don't have a clear definition of life. Uh, but even if we had, how do we live by this theory? Uh, it means that every time we take antibiotics, we become mass murderers. In fact, every time we wash our hands, we become mass murderers. So this is very, and what do we eat? If it's just as bad to eat a carrot as to, to eat uh, a pig, um, it's very difficult to live by this theory. Um, if we talk about um, planetary protection, it's also difficult because <laughs> If we try to protect possible life on Mars by sterilizing aircraft that we send on Mars, we have to commit mass murder of Earth bacteria in order to protect possible moth bacteria. Where should that lead us? Um, it's very difficult, but... Um, and of course it's also, also theoretically difficult because if, if we have an organism that's alive but not sentient it means that yeah you can you can harm it in some objective sense you can you can kill it for instance but it doesn't have any if we said if, if we manage to somehow figure out that it's not sentient it doesn't have any any it doesn't feel what you're doing to it it doesn't care why should we care so there are, there are issues with this this idea uh, the last one I mentioned is called ecocentrism. Very controversial theory, popular among some, some um, environmental uh, people. It says that not just individual life, but also species, ecosystems, maybe even environments, can have a moral status. Uh, I, I only, only mention it because it, it, it would have implications if we accepted it. It would mean that we would have the rules, what we can do in, in certain environments would be very strict. It does mean, however, that if we, if we find a, a species of bacteria on, on uh, in Europa and want to study them, then we can do that. And we can even, we can even use uh, destructive methods. Because as long as the species survives, it doesn't matter what we do to the individuals. So, uh, I thought maybe I'll stop um, lecturing for a while and, and um, instead ask you guys. Um, because we have some kind of conclusion here. There are many philosophical issues in astrobiology. Um, even some seemingly pure science questions like... Um, What's the nature of evidence? It's actually a philosophical question. Um, and the philosophy has an important role to play in astrobiology. Mm -hmm.